Hey there, welcome to this lecture in the oxygen isotopes and lakes lecture series. And this is the fourth lecture, and in this uh, discussion, we'll focus on lake carbonates and isotopes. <clears throat> Again, I'm Matt Finkenbinder. I'm a geologist and professor at Brooks University, and <clears throat> these lectures are um, uh, co-authored and uh, given by Dr. Jonathan Dean, uh, who's at the University of Hull. All right, so topics that we'll cover in this lecture first include some basics on <clears throat> lake sedimentation and uh, how we can classify different types of sediments that will accumulate in lake basins. Then we'll talk about a really special kind of lake that's important here, and that's called a marl lake. <clears throat> and we'll also discuss this concept of alkalinity and how that's a important concept uh, to help us understand um, how different carbonate minerals will form in freshwater systems like lakes. We'll then uh, really dig into uh, the chemistry of this and discuss what's called the carbonate equilibrium series. <clears throat> That'll in turn lead us into a discussion of uh, uh, orthogenic carbonate minerals that will precipitate in lakes during what are called whiting events. <clears throat> and then last, we'll uh, tie this all back together uh, with isotopes and talk about carbonate stable isotopes. And so in short, what we're going to look at here is the controls on the solute chemistry of lakes, uh, in particular marl lakes, and how the isotopic composition of water in a marl lake ends up actually being archived or stored in a carbonate mineral that ends up precipitating or crystallizing within the lake itself. Okay, so at the outset, we wanna talk about lake sedimentation. So uh, in the previous lecture, we acknowledged that lakes are just simply basins or low-lying features on land. And certainly they end up filling up with water, uh, but also they will end up uh, filling in with sediments. And we discussed how that they're pretty short-lived or transient features over geological time because they end up um, pretty rapidly infilling with sediments and geological materials. So <clears throat> this uh, concept sketch here is showing a diagram of a lake and its watershed or catchment. <clears throat> and the point uh, in uh, showing this is to acknowledge and discuss that lakes are receiving inputs of material from a variety of different sources. The first would be the um, <clears throat> watershed itself, and so the area on land that contributes water to the lake. So first off, we have obviously water, <clears throat> but also things like nutrients and sediments, minerals, uh, organic materials, and plants. We then have, uh, then have inputs from the atmosphere. <clears throat> so obviously precipitation, rain and snow, but also things like trace metals, pollen grains, dust, charcoal, volcanic ash, and also um, nutrients will fall from the sky, so to speak. And we then have inputs from the ground, groundwater inputs, so obviously water itself, but also dissolved species or solutes um, and nutrients. And then last, we have internal inputs from the lake itself. And so that would include things like, uh, you know, plants and animals that are living in the lake, uh, but also importantly, uh, uh, some minerals can actually end up precipitating and crystallize in the lake water. And in turn, all of that then ends up falling down to the lake floor and it becomes integrated into the sediment record um, that forms at the floor of the lake. And so <clears throat> over, over time, let's say over geological time scales, uh, these inputs might change, and ultimately all of those inputs of material end up very slowly accumulating, and they form uh, a really, to me, interesting layered, archi uh, layered archive of those material inputs over time. <clears throat> okay, so continuing on this discussion then, and now we're looking at a, a cross-section view of a uh, open basin lake. And it shows all the different types of sediments or materials that you might expect to find across uh, the lake basin. So we tend to have what are called clastic sediment inputs, uh, typically common uh, along the edges of a lake. So let's say around the shoreline or um, where a stream flows into the lake at a delta. And so clastic sediments, uh, this is a type of sediment that refers to the weathered or broken down fragments of material <clears throat> that's coming from any pre-existing rock. 
And so the weathering or the breaking down process takes place on land. And then we have sediment transport, um, where, where the material itself is actually moved to the lake itself, usually via streams, but also that can happen due to winds, glaciers, um, or uh, landslides or mass wasting from adjacent hill slopes. In addition, we can have uh, in situ formation or production of chemical and biological sediments. And this is really common in most lakes in the world. So biological sediments refers to just the remains of dead plants and animals. And then we can have chemical sediments actually forming in the lake itself. And that's due to the process of crystallization or precipitation from ions in solution in the lake itself. Okay, so now we're gonna shift gears a little bit and talk about a marl lake, which is also uh, known as a carbonate lake or an alkaline lake. This is a, uh, a really special type of lake. They're um, um, not really that common because we have a couple key um, requirements to form this special type of lake or a marl lake. The first thing is that they're primarily found in areas of carbonate bedrock. And uh, what I mean there is either limestone or dolostone. And in particular, the presence of that, <clears throat> that carbonate bedrock uh, makes, them, uh, makes the water in the lake uh, have a high alkalinity. And so what I mean by that is that it has a high dissolved bicarbonate or carbonate ion concentration. And that combination of having that bedrock and having a high concentration of these dissolved ions in solution causes in situ production or precipitation of carbonate minerals actually within the water column of the lake itself, typically during the summer months. And this ends up then producing a, uh, a layer of sediments um, uh, that consist of those carbonate minerals. They're very unique in appearance. Uh, the uh, slide here shows a lake called uh, Little Limestone Lake in Manitoba in Canada. And many uh, carbonate lakes or marl lakes will look like this. They'll have this kind of light blue, uh, what I describe as being aquamarine type appearance, which uh, you know, very much looks like a Caribbean blue hole. Um, this is really, uh, really exciting because uh, at this location here, we're at uh, 55 degrees north in the boreal forest. And so we're in uh, pretty northern Canada and we see this lake that looks like you're in the tropics. Okay, so just to add a bit more detail to that discussion, we talked about alkalinity. This is a really important concept and so we'll dig uh, into the details a bit more here. So <clears throat> alkalinity, refers to the ability of a water sample or of a natural water to neutralize or to buffer against acids. So we can uh, quantify or we can calculate this uh, base neutralizing or buffering capacity of water two ways. First, we have what's called total alkalinity, and that's a measure of the net effect of all cations or positively charged ions and all anions or negatively charged ions that contribute to this uh, neutralizing capacity of acids. And so total alkalinity is a function of all of these dissolved species. We've got CO2, carbonic acid, bicarbonate, carbonate, plus free hydrogen ions, and then hydroxyl ions. However, it's typically, uh, we typically approximate alkalinity using something called the carbonate alkalinity. And we do that because uh, the uh, ions that contribute to carbonate alkalinity are usually the most common in natural water systems. So the carbonate alkalinity is a function of the concentration of just two of those ions, and that's HCO3 minus, which is bicarbonate, plus CO3 to minus, which is carbonate. And so therefore, carbonate alkalinity is really a sum concentration of those two things. And again, in most natural systems, uh, then that is the primary uh, means of buffering acid. And so the uh, diagram on the left here uh, from the, uh, uh, this NASA graphic is showing kind of the cycling of different uh, dissolved species in a lake and in turn, how we actually get uh, some of those materials. 
And so we can get CO2 from the atmosphere that in turn will um, then end up mixing with water to form carbonic acid. And then we have uh, all these other uh, uh, ionic species coming from the process of chemical weathering on land, which then contributes those ions into solution into the lake. Okay, so um, next we want to briefly just uh, recognize and discuss uh, two different basic types of carbonate rocks. So I mentioned that carbonate rocks are a prerequisite uh, to form a moral lake. And so we've got two basic types of carbonate rocks. The most common by far and away is called limestone. The chemical formula for limestone is just calcium carbonate. Um, good example of that in the UK is the White Cliffs of Dover in England, which are composed of or made of chalk, which is a fine grain variety of limestone. Then we've got another lesser common variety called dolostone. And uh, dolostone has this slightly different chemical formula. It's got 50% calcium cations, 50% magnesium cations, and then that carbonate anion complex. And um, I think probably the most famous place to um, you know, think about dolomite uh, in Europe is the uh, dolomite subrange in the Italian Alps, which is composed of this very resistant dolostone, again, which is the um, second most common carbonate uh, rock type that we see on Earth. Okay, so further in this uh, discussion, now we're gonna talk about something called the carbonate equilibrium system. So the carbonate equilibrium system is uh, shown here in this plot and it plots in the x-axis, we have got the pH of water and on the y-axis, we have the relative abundance of the three most common dissolved inorganic carbon species that are typically found in natural waters. So those include CO2, um, which is um, you know, dissolved carbon dioxide, and then we've got, uh, uh, in the middle of this plot, we have HCO3 minus, that's bicarbonate. And then we have uh, carbonate, which is CO3 2 minus. Okay, so the point I want to make here is that in unpolluted natural water systems, then it turns out that pH of the water, or the acidity or uh, basicity of the water, is ultimately a function of the relative concentration of these three dissolved inorganic carbon species. So the way it works is that we tend to have more carbonic acid or dissolved CO2 if we have pHs less than six. And we can see that on the left-hand side of the diagram. Note that as we move from pH of 4 to pH of 6, we've got this big decrease in uh, dissolved CO2, and then we have this ramping up and increase in bicarbonate. And so in the circumneutral pHs between 6 and 10, or 6 and 9, and then we have bicarbonate being the dominant dissolved inorganic carbon species. And then we have um, uh, at higher pHs greater than 10, you can see that, that bicarbonate ends up decreasing, and then we have, uh, in turn, uh, this ramp up of carbonate. And so at pH is greater than 10, then we have um, carbonate being the dominant dissolved inorganic carbon species in the lake itself. Okay, so we're almost there. So the point in recognizing all of this is that the pH of lake water actually ends up changing a little bit over seasonal time scales and also over diurnal or day to night time scales. And primarily those seasonal changes in lake water pH is due to a series of biochemical processes, namely the process of photosynthesis and then the reverse of that which is oxidation or respiration. Okay, so now we're going to talk about um, carbonate precipitation. And so when the water chemistry conditions are perfect in a lake, that ends up causing uh, orthogenic carbonate minerals to precipitate in the lake itself. And we call this a whiting event. So and this typically will happen in the late spring and summer. If a lake freezes in the winter, it will ice out and melt it will overturn or mix, that replenishes nutrients in the surface part of the lake. <clears throat> and then the process of photosynthesis begins in the lake. 
And so various primary producers or algae will begin consuming or using dissolved CO2 in the lake. And as they continuously use dissolved CO2, they extract it from the water. And that in turn ends up shifting the carbonate equilibrium balance to more um, basic or higher pHs. And so this in turn uh, ends up, um, we end up losing CO2. We increase the concentration of bicarbonate and carbonate. The pH increases, and at some point then, we have what's called saturation. And when the pH is high enough, bicarbonate will become saturated. There's just too much of it in the water itself. And if there's any free calcium or magnesium, that will cause those to come together in the summer months. And then we have precipitation of carbonate minerals in the water column. So here we see, uh, in this case, uh, at Little Limestone Lake, this really, again, kind of Caribbean uh, aquamarine appearance. And we have a current whiting event taking place where the water has a high pH, we have saturation, calcium combines with bicarbonate to form calcium carbonate, and that also releases a unit of carbonic acid back into the system. <clears throat> so this is a uh, inorganic physical process. It's also important to recognize that many aquatic organisms uh, will build their hard parts out of calcium carbonate as well. And so things like bivalves or gastropods or ostracods. <clears throat> and uh, when these uh, organisms will uptake bicarbonate, um, then they build their hard parts, typically out of calcium carbonate or aragonite. <clears throat> and collectively, uh, these are known as biogenic carbonates. All right, so now to tie this all back to the isotope story. So uh, what we see here, again, is a cross-section of a lake. We uh, previously acknowledged that most water in a lake is h 2 but there is some of that h 2 So when carbonate minerals precipitate in the summer months due to this shift in pH from photosynthesis, or when biogenic carbonates, um, carbonates form, then it turns out that the uh, delta 18O value of lake water is actually archived in the crystal lattice of the mineral or in the biogenic carbonates that form the shell material. And so this ends up producing a snapshot of the lake chemistry at the time the mineral precipitated or at the time that the organism actually uh, took up that bicarbonate to help build its shell material. So then we have that material, either the uh, mineral or the shell carbonate, will eventually, um, after death or after slow settling, that will accumulate at the bottom of the lake and that will form again a layered archive over geological time. Okay, so uh, Morrow Lakes then, it turns out, are excellent uh, archives of paleo or ancient climate conditions. And that's because, um, and again, we previously acknowledged this, that lakes are basins or low-lying depressions on land. They fill rapidly with sediments. We acknowledged also that lakes are receiving inputs from many different places. And so as the climate changes, inputs of sediment will in turn change, and that produces a layered archive of past environmental and also climate conditions. And so what we can do then as paleoscientists that work on lakes is we can go to lakes and we can collect uh, sediment core samples, which are just simply tubes of sediment um, that uh, will help us then understand past conditions. So we can do this two times. In the summer, we can uh, use boats, we can go out, we can anchor, and then we can collect core samples when it's uh, nice and sunny, but typically very buggy. <clears throat> or we can also go in the winter when uh, the lake freezes over and we can uh, just auger a hole through the uh, lake ice and then we can collect core samples uh, in the winter as well. It's actually somewhat easier in the winter because there's less bugs, although obviously it can be freezing cold. And here are some uh, examples of some field work I did recently. Um, so uh, this is a uh, project in uh, the Canadian Rockies where we uh, went out in the summer and we used inflatable boats and built a raft and we collected uh, successive one meter length sediment core samples uh, from that, um, that study lake. <clears throat> 
<clears throat> and then we uh, take those core samples back to the lab. We split them and we can photograph them. And <clears throat> the bottom image here shows uh, one of those uh, representative uh, sediment cores uh, from this lake in Canada. And note that we've got some uh, really striking, and I think interesting layers and differences in color here, which reflect uh, variable concentrations of uh, those carbonate minerals, but also of inputs of organic matter. Okay, so here are the summary questions for this uh, fourth lecture on um, carbonate uh, isotopes in lakes. And so again, these are important. Please review these because if you can answer all of these questions, then conceptually, I think you'll uh, really get the big picture topics that we covered in this lecture. Thanks for listening.